now going to understand why Gaussians are so important and the answer to that is what's called the central limit theorem. We need to understand what the theorem is and we're also going to need to understand where the theorem doesn't apply because it's sometimes misused. The setup is let's consider a bunch of random variables x sub i they don't have to have the same distribution. One of the variables could be a Gaussian. One of them might have a probability distribution, which is the portrait of Abraham Lincoln, the profile. They can be arbitrary functions. And we're going to form a sum of some large number of them. Or actually, the calculation will go through more easily if we form an average. So I'm going to divide by the number of random variables here. So that's a sum of random variables that are individually x sub i divided by n. I'm also going to assume that each of these random variables has zero mean, as indicated here. That's actually not a loss of generality, because for each variable you can figure out what its mean is, and then subtract off that mean to get a new random variable of zero mean, and then when you're all done and want to compute the sum, add back in those individual means and I'm going to skip writing down the equations for that part. So here's the proof of the central limit theorem. We're going to calculate the characteristic function phi sub s of this average of the individual random variables up here. Since it's a sum, the characteristic function of the sum will just be the product of all the characteristic functions. The individual variables are xi divided by n. Now we're going to use that scaling law that we derived for characteristic functions and, a, and that allows us to put the 1 over n inside the argument of the characteristic functions here. Now we're going to take each of these characteristic functions and write down its Taylor series expansion. That is to say its value at t equals 0 and then there would be a term that's linear in t, but recall that the coefficient of the Taylor series expansion of the characteristic function, the coefficients are moments, and since we've assumed that the first moment, the mean, is zero, there's no term linear in t down here. So the first non-vanishing term is this term involving the second moment, or standard deviation squared, that I've written here, and you can go back and look at how the moments come into the Taylor series expansion of the characteristic function to see that I've gotten this one right. And then there would be higher moments coming in here. Now I'm just going to rewrite this product in the perhaps non-intuitive way that the product of a bunch of any things is the exponential of the sum of the logs of those same any things. So that's just an exact identity. Now let's introduce an approximation for the first time. The approximation is the log of 1 minus x is approximately just minus x when x is small, as we're going to assume for our Taylor series expansion terms here. Notice that they become small as n, the number of random variables, becomes large. So in that case, I have the minus a half, which comes out here, and I have the sum that acts on the sigma squareds, t squareds, that comes here, and you can see that I get this expression here. Well, look at that. This thing is a Gaussian in the variable t squared, and it has this coefficient. And you'll recall that we derived that the characteristic function of a Gaussian, of a normal, is normal, and therefore we can read right off that the probability distribution corresponding to this characteristic function must be a normal distribution of mean zero and variance as given right up here in this term. So that's the central limit theorem. But what did we do along the way that could possibly make the technical conditions of this theorem not be satisfied? Well, right up here at the start, we assumed that the characteristic function has a convergent Taylor series around zero. And we've already seen an example of a probability function that doesn't have that property, the Cauchy distribution, which you'll recall was non-analytic at zero. So in fact, the central limit theorem fails for Cauchy distribution. It fails even if one of the x's 
that you're summing here is a Cauchy distribution. So that's a condition we better watch out for. We also assumed that the terms here became negligible here and here, um, that they decrease with n, but how fast do they decrease with n? If the characteristic function falls off only very slowly, in other words, it might be convergent, this, this series might be convergent, but only very slowly convergent, then we'd better worry a little bit about whether the central limit theorem actually applies. Intuitively, what's going on in the central limit theorem, or I should say the second half of that proof of the second theorem, is this. We've got a product of a whole bunch of characteristic functions. And we know that they all start at 1 and have no linear term, and then have a negative quadratic term. So I've drawn here, in the various colors, a whole bunch of functions that have that kind of property. They start at 1 and they just have different degrees of, of negative curvature as they fall off. Now we're going to take the product of all of these functions. And the product of a bunch of 1's is just 1. But as soon as I get away from 1, I'm taking the product of things that are going down. And basically the central limit theorem says that if I take enough of these products, these the product will fall so rapidly from 1 that I only get to see that second derivative term coming in right near the origin. I lose all memory of the details of what the actual shapes of this curve are. Once I decide that I'm seeing just a parabola in this space, then I know I've got a normal distribution. And that's basically, in characteristic function space, the central limit theorem. Now, the central limit theorem is usually stated about the sum of random variables, not their average, so let's just clean that up. What we found is that the probability distribution of an average of a bunch of variables is a normal with this variance. And what we might have been computing instead is what is the probability distribution of a sum of a bunch of xi's. So that would be just n times our s. Now, if I take a random variable and I multiply it by constant n, its variance gets multiplied by n squared. You can see that in directly in the formula for variance because it's the expectation value of the square of a variable that has an n squared minus the expectation squared and each of those expectations has an n so there's a common factor of n squared. So basically going back up here you can see that the probability distribution of just the straight sum of the xi's will be this thing multiplied with its variance multiplied by n squared, or the sum of the variances of the individual variables. So that's the very simple statement of the theorem, that if you sum the variables, you just sum their variances, and the result is normal. Of course, I've subtracted off the means, so you would actually also sum the means of the individual variables to get the value that would go into this slot, the mean of the normal distribution. But again, let's restate the technical conditions. n has to be large enough. In other words, the sum of two arbitrary random variables is not normal, although it will start to be looking like normal in many cases. n has to be large. The higher moments have to be well behaved. And the Taylor series expansion has to exist. In real life, you sometimes meet borderline cases where the assumptions hold technically, but when you're dealing with a finite sample of data, the convergence to normal is very slow, or it can be very highly non-uniform. For example, it can converge to something that looks like normal in the middle in the bell-shaped region, but the tails can be very slow to converge, and that's something to watch out for. So that's the central limit theorem, the sense in which Gaussian distributions or normal distributions are universal. Let's learn to estimate the parameters, the mean and the standard deviation of a normal distribution if we're given a set of points drawn from it. For now, I'm going to just find what's called the maximum a priori, or MAP, estimate of mu and sigma by Bayesians. 
and frequentists call this the maximum likelihood estimate or MLE estimate. The point is that as Bayesians we know that given some data mu and sigma have a probability distribution and I'm not going to try right now to give you the whole distribution I'm just going to, to find the most likely single values of mu and sigma together. So the data is a bunch of x's, x sub i, and they're drawn from some normal distribution, we're supposing, and we want to find its mean and standard deviation. What's our statistical model? Do you remember what a statistical model is? A statistical model is simply a means of calculating the probability of the data we see, here it's written as a vector of x's, given the parameters of the model, mu and sigma. And in this case, because the xi's are assumed to be independent normals, we just take the individual normal probability distribution for each xi, and by independence we can just take the product of those probabilities. So now we do the Bayes thing. The posterior estimate of mu and sigma given the data is the probability of the data given the parameters simply repeating what's up here notice that the product of a bunch of exponentials is an exponential of the sum of things so I can get this and then as always I have to have a prior and as usually I'm going to take the uniform prior on mu the non-informative prior actually on both mu and sigma jointly. When I do that I can find the maximum a posteriori parameters by simply finding where the derivatives of p, the, the posterior estimate, vanish when I take them with respect to both mu and sigma here. So there's a little bit of algebra and you can work it out that the derivative with respect to mu is this we want to solve this for mu and just staring at it you can see that mu is simply the average of the data points and similarly if you take the derivative with respect to sigma you'll get a formula like this and you can see that the solution for that says that sigma squared the variance is simply the average of the deviation of the individual data points from mu and we had mu right up here. So that's pretty easy. It's actually a not trivial statement, but it just turns out simple that the map estimate of the mean is the sample mean, and the map estimate of the variance is the sample variance, where the sample are simply the finite number of data points that we happen to have in hand. You may have seen a formula like this before with an n minus 1 in the denominator instead of an n. And you might be wondering what's going on here. That has a name. That's called Bessel's correction. Well, it's not that we did anything wrong in the calculation here. These are, in fact, the maximum likelihood, or MAP, estimates of mu and sigma as computed and with an n here. Frequentists worry about something called bias. It turns out that although this is the most probable value of sigma squared, it's not the mean or expectation value of sigma squared, which is a little bit different, essentially because the distribution of sigma squared is a little bit skewed, and so the mode and the mean won't occur at the same point. So if you work out what small correction you have to add to the MLE estimate to get the unbiased estimate, so-called, you'll discover that that just introduces an n minus 1 in the denominator. You know enough about expectations to be able to calculate that now, so let me leave that as an exercise to you, or if you look at the Wikipedia article for Bessel's correction, you'll see a explicit algebraic proof laid out. Bayesians don't worry as much as frequentists about whether estimates are biased or not. And the reason is 
Bayesians don't like point estimates anyway. Bayesians like to see the whole distribution of the probability of, for example, in this case, mu and sigma squared jointly. And in that whole distribution, one can see what is the peak value, that would be the map estimate, but also is it skew, and just decide whether you whether it makes sense to compute a an unbiased estimator, whether that's a good summary of the data or not. So there's nothing wrong with unbiased estimators, but they're simply not as important to Bayesians as they are to frequentists. By the way, you might be wondering whether I actually did algebra by hand when I computed these derivatives. And the answer is, of course not. I always do algebra by Mathematica. And I'll leave you with this page that simply shows how easily Mathematica is able to compute those derivatives. And let us see the formulas for mu and sigma squared that we wrote down on the previous page, just slightly more simplified.